All right, uh, welcome back everybody. Um, my name is Dr. Cao. Uh, I am a practicing emergency uh, medicine physician. I'm today joined by uh, Dr. James Bank. He's a radiologist um, and educator as well, and he'll be talking to us about radiology. Um, so welcome, James. Thank you. Uh, to start off, can you briefly uh, describe what you do as a radiologist and how long you've been practicing, uh, things like that? Sure. So I am a uh, musculoskeletal imaging uh, fellowship trained radiologist. I uh, mostly do diagnostic radiology work. Mm -hmm. um, radiology is a long road, uh, it's similar to kind of comparable to some subspecialty uh, within medical and surgical fields. Mm -hmm. So we do, it's a total of five years of residency, including a one year internship. Um, so four, then followed by four years of radiology and then typically another year of fellowship. So six total after med school. So uh, my fellowship at Mayo Clinic Florida where uh, I did uh, 12 months of, of pure MSK. So it was okay. working with orthopedic surgeons, also doing some neuro radiology with spine, doing mm -hmm. a ton of procedures like over 600 uh, musculoskeletal like biopsies and joint injections, joint aspirations. So it was a uh, tremendous experience for, for that area. Now in the real world, I'm back to kind of doing about 50% MSK. Okay. And then the rest is sort of a mix of trauma, radiology, like neuroradiology, general body. Um, so we kind of have, uh, there's maybe 10 or 11 different subspecialties within radiology. And it's kind of one of the trends within the field at the moment is this increasing subspecialization. So mm -hmm. in our practice, we have almost everybody is fellowship trained and um, they all have their own kind of areas. So when there's a complex neuro case or a complex nuclear medicine case, then the appropriate person takes those. But we all sort of generally share the more bread and butter type cases that um, for you know abdominal pain or headache or you know. Um, and then there is a lot of communication and, and interplay. So it's a um, it is really like a team sport. Um, okay, cool. So yeah. All right. Thanks for that. Uh, so, I mean, looking back uh, through med school years or pre-med uh, years, um, do you know why you chose uh, radiology as a specialty and what other uh, fields did you also consider as well? Yeah, good question. So I initially, I had wanted to go into primary care field, uh, mm -hmm. pediatrics or family medicine, internal medicine, something of like that. I felt myself to be fairly you know, empathetic and I like people and I was extroverted, really enjoyed kind of being social and wanted to stay away from fields that I saw as more isolating, you know, like that where you were kind of more in your own space. Yeah. Uh, then when I rotated through, I actually had my radiology rotation early in my third year, uh, almost to get it out of the way, just because I knew it was not something that I was remotely interested in. Yeah. Uh, but without, you know, for no reason, I had no experience in it. I just was already dismissing it. Got through, it was like two weeks, I think, and found it really fascinating and was really glad I had that experience because I felt like that would make me a much better clinician and physician, understanding how imaging studies work and the, the um, utilization and appropriateness for those uh, diagnostic and screening tests. Uh -huh. And I move on to do like peds and family and felt, um, I, I really, I did love those fields, but uh, not, uh, not in a way that I felt would sustain me in the long term. Mm -hmm. um, almost, um, it's kind of hard to, to describe, but almost like that I would, um, I would absorb all yeah. of the issues and all the, you know, and there's a lot of psychosocial, a lot of, you know, financial and, and other inter interpersonal issues that come along with with yeah. uh, care that you're dealing with, you're in their lives. There's, it's more than just the medicine. There's yeah. uh, so there's stuff goes in, which is really fascinating, but I felt also in my own way that I would take that all home with me and I wasn't sleeping. I wasn't eating well. It was yeah. just like a, um, uh, like a, it was uh, this weight on, on me that I, I felt like I would probably burn out uh, within my first few years of practicing. Yeah. I kind of, did a little bit of soul searching and reassessment and figure out, okay, what can I do that maybe would put up some, uh, some barrier 
between mm -hmm. myself and, and the patient. So I looked at some uh, anesthesia, uh, you know, yeah. pathology, surgery, anesthesia, yeah. uh, or uh, radiology. And uh, thinking back to the radiology rotation that I had done that I really loved, I was like, you know what, I'm going to maybe see if I didn't give this a fair shake the first time around. Yeah. Did a, a four week rotation, like at the beginning of my fourth year, loved it, like met some great mentors, mm -hmm. started doing some research and working th with them with their teaching files. And that just opened that whole world to me. And I, I fell in love and I've been, um, yeah, I've been happy and uh, extremely glad that I had that course correction at that stage uh, that I feel that this is a better fit for me. Yeah, it was almost like a, a quarter life crisis of what am I doing? <laughs> Like I'm now in my third year of med school and everything I've been planning towards is like the floor, I mean, you know, I'm falling through the floor here and didn't know if there was anything that could catch me. So um, that's, I think it's important to explore these different fields sooner than later. Yeah. Uh, everything a fair shot. Don't close the door prematurely on any, any field. You never know really what will grab you or what will be the most sustaining for you in the long term until you... Uh, what uh, personal qualities do you think make for a successful uh, radiologist? So communication is key. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of what we do is through communicating in, in the written word. So we're drafting reports that get sent to the referring clinicians about entailing in there all the imaging findings and our impression of those findings. So being able to use your words in a way that's you know, descriptive, but also succinct to get your point across and to um, convey your level of suspicion for different abnormalities mm -hmm. uh, in a way that's clear to, to them. And also now that patients are having increasing access and there's more transparency for patients to view their own reports, you know, through portals or other, other means, it's also important to be able to explain something that, that they will understand uh, and, and can be actionable. Um, so that's, that's key. You know, a lot of our, a lot of what, how we communicate to each other is uh, majority of the content that's that's received is in interpersonal communication is through our you know our tone of voice our expressions yeah body language and so when you when you pull those things out of it and all you're left with is a piece yeah. of paper with words on it it, it uh, you really have to be pretty expert at, at doing that um, and I do you know I see my residents that I work with as they uh, kind of move from one year to the next their writing ability does improve, but it, it yeah. is helpful to kind of have a natural, have that as like a natural uh, ability. I think also imagination is really important. Being able to conceptualize a two-dimensional image into a 3D structure yeah. in your brain and be able to see how these different uh, components interact in a system, you know, and, and you know, where you, and then kind of knowing when you see one thing, how, what inferences to make based on the presence or absence of a finding and all that kind of getting together, fixing it with disease processes. And so it can be relatively complex. It's more than just kind of look at an x-ray, but then there's all of this information that's contained there in that image that you have to uh, tease it out and kind of know where to look and how to, I guess, um, extrapolate and, and extract that, that, uh, I think that, that takes a lot of imagination also to kind of then present a differential diagnosis of like, what are all the things that this could possibly represent uh, in the patient and the relative probability of those diseases based on what you see and knowing that kind of that long list is, is really helpful to yeah. physicians who are you know, taking care of the patient to then say, oh, you know, okay, maybe this could be sarcoid or mm -hmm. other things that they hadn't considered yet. What do you find the most exciting aspect or satisfying for you? So I really enjoy I enjoy the work. I really do love reading images and uh, it's, it's a, a very kind of cerebral exercise and sort of you're, you are kind of with, you know, you're in your own head looking mm -hmm. at this. Uh, I, I'm fortunate, I think, in my job where that's not the only thing that I do. I also am involved in a lot of teaching. Yeah. Uh, there is a lot of interdisciplinary work. Uh, at my hospital, we have tumor boards that I'm involved with for oncology care. It's sort of an interdisciplinary uh, meeting that happens every week with we have a you know, oncologist and surgeons and uh, pathologists that are discussing uh, different cases and mm -hmm. the treatment approaches, and we look at the imaging, and it's uh, so that's that's a very satisfying part of my job to have that those sort of collegial interactions. 
Uh, also with uh, my residents that I teach. So we go over cases and I'm giving them kind of, you know, the different pearls and pitfalls and uh, some, we'll look up, you know, they might have a case where it's something I'm not familiar with or a rare manifestation of a common disease or something of that nature. So we'll kind of Google it together and uh, yeah. find, some, you know, companion cases or see what's been written about that in, in the literature. And sometimes that even sparks like a, a research project of, well, this is something that hasn't been published or hasn't been looked at maybe in 20 years. You know, why don't we use this case as a, an example to do a review of the, the literature? So there's some, uh, yeah, some more academic um, components of, of my particular uh, situation. Yeah, there's no, no two radiology practices are the same. Mm -hmm. uh, some are like mine as sort of an academic uh, private practice hybrid. Uh, others are pure academic. Uh, where they really focus on research time and academic appointments depend on scholarly activity, whereas others are purely private practice and all they do is crank out studies and it's just a productivity-based model. Uh, some are outpatient, where there's no call, uh, no nights, uh, you just read you know, routine studies uh, and it's a lot less kind of intensity. There can be some, still a lot of complex cases, that's where a lot of oncology follow-up happens uh, in the outpatient setting. Uh, mine, which is mostly hospital-based, inpatient, ER uh, stuff. There's a lot more stat reads, stroke alerts, uh, you know, PE studies, uh, like a lot of uh, more kind of complex acute care mm -hmm. uh, issues. So sort of different types of practice environments with different pathologies there. So it really depends, you know, on different personality types. Once you get out of training, then you would say, you know what, this seems more like a fit for me. I don't mind doing a few weekends a year. It's so like for me, my group, we do 10 weekends a year of call. Mm -hmm. um, other are more or less, depending on how busy the call shifts are, you know, how much outpatient volume they have versus inpatient volume, et cetera. Um, yeah, it seems, yeah, it seems radiology is quite flexible on what you kind of want to do, depending on your, uh, your personality, like you want more human interaction. So that's why you probably chose the route you chose. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I enjoy teaching. Mm -hmm. So some people, that's not their thing. It's mm -hmm. fine. But a lot of jobs where there's no teaching involved, but mine, we're, even though we are kind of a private practice, I do have academic appointments at uh, three universities in the area. And I do a fair amount of, of lecturing and small group activities. And also you know, we have our med student clerkships where mm -hmm. students rotate through our, our, um, our reading room. And so quite a bit of involvement there too, which I really enjoy. Cool. Oh, thanks for that. Uh, so on the other end of the spectrum, what uh, do you dislike about radiology? Kind of one of the things that is a big stressor in my field is when um, the studies are just piling up uh, and they're scanning them faster than we can read them. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then that is like a source of you know, aggravation or we're yeah. feeling um, you know, frustrated that you're not able to uh, deliver that kind of, uh, I guess, the, the quality of that you, you want to uh, mm -hmm. because of time pressure, wanting to get that study turned around within a reasonable time so the patients aren't waiting, the doctor ordered isn't waiting to decide what the next step is going to be, um, but you just can't get to that study quick enough because there's so many others that yeah. uh, at the same time. So it's that can be, um, that I'd, I'd say is probably the, the thing that I really, really don't like. Uh, Anyhow, um, you, uh, you've discussed about burnt out. Uh, how, how does uh, being a radiologist uh, fit into your like a work-life kind of balance? Yeah, that's a great question. And like I mentioned earlier, there's really no two practices that are the same. Yeah. So the amount of sort of how your shifts are structured mm -hmm. and the amount of downtime, the amount of weekends, the amount of vacation, it's all variable. Like I interviewed at places where some of them were offering uh, 17 weeks a year vacation. Okay. The job I took uh, offered 10 plus holidays, mm -hmm. um, which I think is, is plenty. Uh, the lowest I think I saw was eight, oh, eight wow. weeks a year, which is still pretty generous. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, and then your shifts are maybe eight hours. Our weekend call shifts are 10 hours. Uh, so it's pretty manageable in terms of, you know, how many hours we're working every week and mm -hmm. how much time that we have. Uh, so some academic uh, practices may give you more like CME time, 
Mm -hmm. My group doesn't give us any, but with all the vacation time I have, I don't have an issue being able to go to whatever conferences that I, uh, I want to attend. Cool. Uh, thanks for that. Um, uh, so can you briefly tell us how radiology has changed over the years and then in light of COVID-19 and then maybe uh, touch base on what you think the future of radiology uh, would look like? Yeah, so it's actually really uh, interesting because I think radiology is pretty unique, uh, I guess, compared to the other fields in terms of how quickly things change. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's so uh, technology intensive that the field has uh, dramatically had several revolutions in the last few decades as the technology uh, like outpaces the <laughs> our ability for really like human structures to, to change. So mm -hmm. we, like in the, um, I guess in the nineties really when like everything sort of began, be, began becoming digitized, mm -hmm. uh, that was a total revolution it's in itself. Uh, around that same time, you know, C CT was becoming everywhere. MRI were becoming more common. Imaging centers were opening. There was like this whole boom in the imaging world. Um, and uh, studies became easier to read once they were digital. You could, instead of reading like maybe five CAT scans in a shift on a light box, like each image <laughs> printed out, yeah. you could read um, 20 in a shift or 50 um, mm -hmm. at the processing speeds got better and delivery of that uh, data stream through the servers. So there's an article I just read that tried to figure out how much subspecialization was happening within radiology and yeah. estimated about a 10% increase like in just between 2012 and 2017. Oh, wow. People, like all this becoming more fellowship trained and things, mm -hmm. people really sticking to their own areas like be it neuroradiology or body or pediatric uh, mm -hmm. rather than being more of a multi uh, multi specialty um, kind of in that same in that same realm is the kind of a split between interventional and diagnostic radiology yeah which, uh, within like the last five years basically now if you want to become an interventional radiologist you have to match into that as a fourth year med student mm -hmm. uh, that direct pathway of training rather than Traditionally, you would do a diagnostic radiology residency and then a one-year fellowship in interventional. Mm -hmm. Now, they because interventional radiology has become so complex, yeah, so many procedures like vascular and oncologic, and that they uh, you would really require two years uh, to get mastery there. So they've now either streamlined it into a consolidated like six-year training, mm -hmm. or the traditional one, and then it adds two years, so it becomes seven years oh. to become interventional. So. Yeah, a lot of kind of trends, I guess, within within that of uh, that I can only see that those trends continuing. Mm -hmm. um, also, like with uh, artificial intelligence, we're only seeing really the beginning of of that uh, mm -hmm. now. There's so many applications within medicine for using that for patient scheduling, for protocol selection, uh, for um, for image interpretation. Mm -hmm. or indication of emergent findings. Uh, there's, you know, radiation safety, which uh, really, you know, AI has the ability to, and the, um, the, um, the potential mm -hmm. to affect all of these, these different areas. So exactly how it'll play out is still kind of to be determined. Yeah. Uh, I think scenarios kind of put it in a position of assisting us to do better and be safer, better quality, with um, you know more efficiency, better timeliness, um, but not really so much like supplanting the role of a radiologist or replacing us, mm -hmm. but kind of functioning as like a radiology assistant in that way. Uh, how do you think that's going to affect uh, the job market as well as uh, um, with teleradiology? So th there's no way to really know. I feel like the job market kind of swings. Mm -hmm. like a every 10 15 years okay. so when I was graduating med school for example the job market was like horrible there were uh, two people looking for a job for every job posting oh really uh, yeah so that was actually resulting in one of the least competitive years to enter radiology now mm -hmm. it's sort of back the other way where we have two jobs for every one person looking uh, in terms of AI I'm not I don't think it'll probably affect uh, the job market 
uh, mm -hmm. significantly, I would say for at least 15 to 20 years. Okay. Just because the way that they have to, they say each application of AI itself is a, a, is a use case. And so they have to say like, we want to develop an AI algorithm to affect, you know, to, to detect pulmonary embolisms. Yeah. So then you create this deep learning, this machine learning um, process mm -hmm. to, to, you know, catch every pulmonary embolism. But a PE is maybe one of like a thousand different things that you can, you can pick up on the CT of the chest. Mm -hmm. So you would essentially need a validated use case. Yeah. Every one of those thousand things in order to then have that AI system effectively replace somebody reading that CAT scan. Mm -hmm. um, so all those would need to be kind of developed, FDA approved, and then you still have the risk that that could be wrong. Like if you ask Alexa a question, you know, ask her to play a song and then she starts playing a radio station yeah. that has a sound. Like, so, you know, you're only gonna get out of it what you put in. So there's that kind of, there are some biases in terms of the data that we feed those AI algorithms. If there is some kind of regional bias in terms of disease prevalence or how disease manifests or what sort of tropical diseases or you know whatever that is, mm -hmm. those are gonna skew the product in yeah. a way. And you're only gonna get out of it what kind of what it has available to make sense of. So there is a lot of potential for patient harm or misdiagnosis there, all of that would need to be ironed out before like the job market would be threatened. I think in the yeah. meantime, it might make our jobs easier so that we could focus more on those sort of tumor boards and interdisciplinary activities mm -hmm. on improving patient experience and satisfaction, you know, more like the human, the human side of radiology and invest more there. Cause I really see that being where, you know, that that's something that a computer could never replace. Mm -hmm. so, um, a couple more questions and uh, I'll let you uh, go about your way. Uh, he's on vacation right now. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, what are some of the additional resources that students can use to learn about uh, becoming a radiologist? So I would say first and foremost, um, join societies. I think that across the board, again, like you guys, as you go start thinking about what field to enter, mm -hmm. you should keep, keep an open mind be looking at everything and don't discount any field. And for that same reason, I would join every society that is free for a medical student to join. Get mm -hmm. on their mailing list, start kind of peeking your head around the different, you know, meetings and the topics and what kind of research avenues are available. And, you know, some of that might, um, might really be interesting uh, for you. It's also gonna lay a foundation for your future careers as you start forming, building networks mm -hmm. and, uh, building relationships with people in these in these disciplines. A lot of these societies like uh, the SIR uh, or the ACR or ARRS, like American uh, Rank and Race Society or RSNA, these are, those are like kind of the big ones um, in the US for radiology. A lot of them have med student kind of like corners in the website where you can explore different topics related to medical student education, training, mentorship. And then there's a few radiology websites that are also more education based that uh, you can explore like one's uh, Radiology Cafe, there's mm -hmm. learningradiology.com, startradiology.com, um, uh, Radiology Assistant. Nope. Uh, yeah, and then uh, take a radiology elective if your school offers one. And if yeah. they don't, then you could maybe spend time shadowing a radiologist. Even if you're interested in some other field and you just wanna shadow them for a day, most radiologists will have like a ton of cases that we save in a teaching folder yeah. of really interesting uh, diseases that we've come across and we don't have time to write them up. And so if you're interested in like OBGYN and then we have a really interesting case of like a molar pregnancy or something then, or a, a unusual metastasis of an ovarian tumor, then, you know, you could help them write up that case report and then that you can, you know, use that in your CV if you go whatever route you go, if you go into surgery or radiology or OBGYN, and that's something that is relevant for, for all those fields. Yeah, uh, those are wonderful tips, uh, definitely for students. Um, do you, uh, I'm gonna just kind of end it uh, with uh, last questions. 
Uh, do you have any other uh, top tips or advice uh, for students interested in radiology? Yeah, I would say uh, you know, having research is a big, uh, a big plus when you're applying for, for residencies, as is like having a high step score and uh, you know, being up there in your class rank and letters of recommendation. Those are like the key things. So I would say that, you know, yeah, obviously study hard, do well in your rotations, be interested, be engaged. When you go home at the end of a clerkship, like read some article, like so that you have something to kind of talk about the next day. That'll show that you're interested in that field. It'll help you in the long run. And anything you go to, those are just good habits to build. Uh, in terms of research and letters of recommendation, again, you can knock both of those out by just spending a couple days in a reading room uh, talking to a radiologist, you know, maybe get their schedule so you can kind of make sure that you show up when they're there on different days, work with them on a case report or something, they'll be able to gauge your ability, your professionalism, your communication skills, all those things that can go into a letter of recommendation. Uh, and then you'll get that research experience as well for writing up a case report or whatever it is. Maybe they're working on some uh, you know, a bigger trial or something that you can be involved in. Yeah. Uh, never hurts to ask to get involved. And uh, usually, you know, most people will, will be happy and will be receptive. Uh, I think also as you go through your different rotations, you can, uh, you can, you, you can ask uh, at the beginning to, if for your preceptor to potentially write you a letter of recommendation at the completion of it. That way you're at least sort of like, setting that you, yourself up mm -hmm. so that then they're kind of paying more attention to you and the effort you're putting forth when it comes time for them to work, fill out your evaluation they can include all those things and then if you're it's a favorable <laughs> evaluation let's hope it is yeah then you can you know ask them to just kind of take all those comments and put it into a letter of recommendation and um and then that way you know you're not stuck scrambling for one maybe mm -hmm. try to go back a year later to somebody who you had on your surgery rotation at the beginning of your third year to write you a letter like yeah. be something that's um, they'll have detailed notes on from your eval or you'll even have a letter of rec you know already on the spot uh, ready yeah. to go so yeah thanks uh thanks for those advice um and i appreciate uh, you giving uh knowledge drop to uh, us uh, i learned quite a bit uh and, and i appreciate uh, giving your time especially during your vacation yeah, um, thanks for having me. I'm really glad that I was able yeah. to share some tips and a little bit about radiology. Yeah, I think this will be super helpful for students um, because we went through it and we kind of understand the process. Um, and so I appreciate it. Um, and thank you.